This is CNN. I'm Frank says no. Catherine Cryer is off today. Thanks for joining us. After putting a scare into everyone over his health, President Bush apparently will more or less resume his routine in Japan today. The White House says stomach flu caused Mr. Bush to collapse during Wednesday's formal dinner hosted by Prime Minister Miyazawa. Our senior White House correspondent, Charles Bierbauer, traveling with the president, joins us now live from Tokyo. It's 8 o'clock in the morning there, Charles. What's the word on Mr. Bush and his schedule? Well, the word is, uh, and this is uh, apparently coming from First Lady Barbara Bush, that the president slept well during the night, and the First Lady did not seem worried, nor does anyone else that we've talked with here in Tokyo. It is still early. We've not yet seen the president, but he has been up. He's been making his phone calls. That's a sign of a fairly typical George Bush. He talked with the vice president up in New Hampshire. The vice president indicated that he had had a chance to talk with the president perhaps about an hour ago now, and the president said he would be conducting business. They will curtail a little bit of the president's schedule. Secretary of Commerce Robert Mossbacher is standing in for him at a breakfast this morning, but the president does expect to go ahead with much of his schedule for the day, according to White House officials. Uh, spokesman Marlon Fitzwater will be briefing here within the half hour approximately. And uh, we'll get a little bit more detail, but the essence of it is that the, uh, the flu which laid the president low last night is apparently not going to slow him down, at least not bring him to a full stop. Uh, on this, his last full day in uh, Tokyo, he does have meetings scheduled with the prime minister. Uh, one other thing that I'm recalling when I talked with him yesterday, he said, gee, I'm feeling about a seven. Seven's not bad on a scale of ten. One White House official pointed out the president had just lost a tennis match, and he doesn't like losing that at all. The uh, prediction is he'll ask for a rematch with the emperor at some point. This is Charles Bierbauer, CNN, live from Tokyo. And before President Bush's doctors were able to diagnose his complaint, there were some tense moments at that state dinner Charles Bierbauer referred to. CNN's Mary Tillotson has the story. After nine frenzied days on the road from Sydney to Osaka, President Bush grew nauseated, vomited, and collapsed in his chair Wednesday night at a Tokyo dinner party hosted by Japanese Prime Minister Miyazawa. The president was examined on the spot by his personal doctor, Burton Lee. Lee's diagnosis, an attack of intestinal flu, not a recurrence of the heart problem that Mr. Bush experienced early last year because of his thyroid condition. A melee erupted as Japanese security guards tried to prevent American reporters from seeing Mr. Bush abruptly leave the dinner. Are you all right, Mr. Bush? Come on. Why not, guys? What happened, sir? What happened, Mr. Bush? Though he looked drawn and disheveled, the president told reporters he felt good. As the motorcade raced through Tokyo, carrying Mr. Bush back to his guest quarters at Akasaka Palace, Prime Minister Miyazawa read a note to his guests about the departed guest of honor. Foreign Ministry called the President's fine arresting at Akasaka Palace. Presidential spokesman Marlon Fitzwater told reporters Mr. Bush was given medicine to calm his nausea, then put to bed for the night, with no special monitoring of his condition. Uh, nothing extraordinary that Dr. Lee does not feel there's any special monitoring required. Uh, all, uh, all aspects of the exam examination indicate that it is a common case of the flu. Mrs. Bush, who stayed at the dinner, made light of the president's illness and hasty exit. But I'm beginning to think it's the ambassador's fault. <laughs> he and George played the emperor and the crown prince in tennis today, and they were badly beaten. When Fitzwater was asked if being felled by the flu might persuade Mr. Bush to slow down, he said, nope, the president likes staying busy. Mr. Bush will skip an early morning breakfast meeting Thursday, but otherwise, says Fitzwater, he'll stick to his schedule the rest of this trip. Mary Tillotson, CNN, Tokyo. It is flu season, of course. Many of us know that through personal knowledge. Doctors who specialize in travel-related ailments, however, say the president may have set himself up for a fall during his current trip to the Pacific region. Their diagnosis from a distance, Mr. Bush may have pushed himself too hard. More now from CNN medical correspondent Andrew Holtz. Australia, Singapore, Korea, and Japan. 
a hard driving schedule with a round of tennis squeezed between diplomatic sessions and meals that may not fit his normal diet. Put all of that together and doctors are not surprised to see a man in his late 60s like President Bush become overwhelmed. Frankly, I'm amazed that he hasn't had and other presidents in the past even haven't had these kind of problems more often because it's a tremendous stress. The president's staff says he has gastroenteritis, which is just a general term for inflammation of the stomach and intestines. The inflammation can have many causes, including viruses or bacteria, which may be passed from person to person or through food. The White House says the president did not suffer food poisoning. Gastroenteritis is sometimes called stomach flu, but it has no connection to this season's viral flu epidemic. Doctors say a sudden collapse can be brought on by dehydration and diarrhea, or what's called a vasovagal attack. When somebody is extremely nauseated, or perhaps vomiting is imminent, uh, the blood pressure can drop suddenly, the pulse can drop uh, suddenly, and you just feel very weak, and a near faint, or even a faint can occur, and that's fairly common. The president's doctors gave him an anti-nausea drug. Other doctors say the president's symptoms probably have no connection to the Graves disease he suffered last year, which made his thyroid overactive and resulted in irregular heartbeats. The president is no longer on heart medication, but since his thyroid gland was medically destroyed, he takes synthetic thyroid hormone pills, as well as aspirin and Coumadin, which help protect against blood clots. A day before the president fell ill, he took a Halcyon pill. That drug may be prescribed to counter sleeplessness due to jet lag. Doctors say while Halcyon shouldn't cause symptoms like the president exhibited, jet lag certainly could make stomach irritation worse. I think to go to the other side of the world to engage in the meetings and the stressful things that he has to do on a daily basis is overwhelming even without another illness. Doctors say with fluids and rest, an otherwise healthy person usually recovers from gastroenteritis in a day or two. Andrew Holtz, CNN reporting. Vice President Dan Quayle is in New Hampshire at this hour. He went ahead with plans to campaign in that key primary state after being formally notified of Mr. Bush's illness and its aftermath. Quayle offered this update on the president's condition a short time ago in Litchfield. I just talked to the president. And he is up and about. He is doing great, uh, voice strong. He says, I'll be out in a few hours uh, carrying on business. I said, well, what happened? He says, I got the flu. <laughs> Want to do it right? Mr. Bush's bout with stomach flu has refocused attention on the vice president. CNN national political correspondent Gene Randall reports. The campaign spotlight for Dan Quayle was prearranged. A two-day trip to New Hampshire designed to bolster President Bush's sagging popularity in the state. The limelight was inadvertent, created by events in Tokyo. From the time Air Force Two set down in Nashua Wednesday morning, there was a focus on the phrase, heartbeat away from the presidency. I was informed uh, by the Situation Room approximately uh, 6.20 uh, uh, this morning. It is the second time President Bush's health has suddenly thrust Dan Quayle into the country's political consciousness. Last May, an irregular heartbeat put George Bush in Bethesda Naval Hospital for two nights. His condition, stabilized by two drugs, was later diagnosed as the result of an overactive thyroid. There was no temporary handover of presidential powers to Quayle, though the White House said Mr. Bush had considered it. With the 92 campaign underway, will the latest bout of presidential ill health affect the vice president's standing with the public? Jules Whitcover, in New Hampshire to cover Quayle, has written a book called Crapshoot, Rolling the Dice on the Vice President. Uh, this particular episode does not seem to be particularly serious. Uh, therefore, uh, probably there is not could be as much concern expressed about uh, whether Dan Quayle is qualified to take over the presidency as there was the last time. Nevertheless, there is some, some concern, and it does serve the purpose of uh, bringing back the whole question again. A CNN poll completed this week shows Quayle with a favorability rating of 41%. 51% surveyed by Gallup had an unfavorable opinion of him. For Democrats, Dan Quayle is an issue presidential candidates in New Hampshire on Wednesday. It raises the specter in, uh, in a lot of people's minds as to who is next in line after President Bush. Obviously, whenever the health issue comes up, that issue of did he choose the right person reverberates in people's minds and brings back a memory that I don't think serves them well. But for the White House, Dan Quayle is a bridge to a GOP right wing, often unsettled by President Bush. 
Some Republicans also cite the makeup of the Democratic field this year as an added complication. Having a lot of other young potential uh, uh, Democrats running this time, uh, talking about the future. And I think the future, whenever you talk about the future, you always have to begin with the Republican Party. You begin focusing on Dan Quayle, who people assume is, is, is the front runner for 1996. Meanwhile, back in New Hampshire, an eventful day for George Bush campaign surrogate Dan Quayle. Vice presidents often complain they get too little attention. The president's health and politics dictate that Dan Quayle will not be making that complaint on this trip to New Hampshire. Gene Randall, CNN, Manchester, New Hampshire. And this note, we are expecting White House spokesman Marlon Fitzwater to conduct a briefing on the president's condition within the half hour. CNN will broadcast that live from Tokyo. Still to come on The World Today, a shot in the arm for the U.S. auto industry. A Detroit product wins car of the year. And a warning for parents about potential health hazards for infants. Stay with us. like to pose the following question. Could your heart benefit from the use of another 24 valves? The Acura Legend Coupe. The man who lives in this house made good money in stocks. The man who lives in this house made even more money selling him the stocks. If you'd like your money to make more money for you instead of someone else, call Oldie Discount. We'll provide you with personal service and investments to help you achieve financial success. So move up to Oldie, America's full-service discount broker. There's constipation, and there's constipation. Oh, yeah. When it's this bad, take it to the max. New Maximum Relief Formula X-Lax Pills with 50% more X-Lax Medicine. For maximum relief, oh, yeah. take it to the max. On CNN Tonight... The president felt sick, but there was no passing of power. Is Dan Quayle qualified in the crossfire? Then former President Richard Nixon visits Larry King live, all tonight on CNN. Concerns over President Bush's health temporarily eclipsed the trade talks at the heart of his visit to Japan. Before he fell ill, Mr. Bush and Prime Minister Miyazawa examined Japan's massive trade surplus with the U.S. No trade agreement has been reached yet, but a general strategy for what's called world growth has, among other things, it calls for Japan to spur domestic demand and commits President Bush to send Congress a plan to strengthen the U.S. economy. Still unresolved, a more specific action plan in which Japan would address specific complaints about its trade policies. When it comes to riding in style and comfort, Americans prefer U.S.-made autos. But when it comes to riding out the recession, they apparently turn to imported cars. That's the conclusion of a new CNN Gallup poll released today. Nearly half of those questioned said American cars are best in overall quality. That compares to 27% for Japanese cars and 19% for German autos. But more than half said Japanese cars are the most economical to operate. And 34% rated American cars the most economical. Only 3% chose German cars. Well, all of those qualities and more go into Motor Trend's choice of car of the year. Every year, the magazine's competition revs up sales for the car that comes out on top. CNN's Ed Garston has the winner for 92. For the auto industry, it's the closest thing to Oscar, Tony, or Emmy. The STS puts Cadillac back on the, back on the map among the finest automakers, not just in America, but worldwide. The Golden Caliper, won by the Cadillac Seville STS this year, is one of the most coveted awards a car can capture. Consumers are so thirsty to get information about what is a good car to buy or not, that awards such as Motor Trend's Car of the Year is extremely important to getting the word out that it is a good vehicle. And there's no question that 
giving an award to a car like this one is going to help its sales. Motor Trend's editor says contending cars are put through a week of rigorous screening by eight staff members. What we're looking for is the one standout car in its class each year. So it could be a big car, it could be a small car. Dick Rusin has designed five Car of the Year winners, including this year's the Cadillac Seville STS, which he says was designed with suggestions from past owners. One of the things that they said was that they wanted the car to be distinctive. So that, for us, was a very strong goal. But not every trade magazine or group plays Rate or Ride the same way. Car and Driver lists its 10 best cars, but in no particular order. Cars which include the Nissan 300ZX Turbo, the Plymouth Laser Turbo, Lexus SC400, and the Ford Taurus Show. The first criteria is excellence, pure and simple. The second criteria is that the car not cost more than $40,000. The third criteria is that it has to light your fire in one way or the other. Cars that strike a match for the Auto Club of America come under slightly more practical scrutiny. We test the vehicles what an average consumer would be looking for in a car. Rather than taking a vehicle typically on a test track and rating it on high speed and handling and acceleration and braking, we basically check also the vehicle, how it's finished, how it's laid out inside, the comfort level, how easy is it to load the trunk area. And because the awards can mean rewards on the sales floor, there's always the feeling that car companies have strong lobbying efforts to win. Well, not exactly. The lobbying takes place in the form of uh, the car companies making sure that the cars that get tested for whatever award they're going up for are absolutely perfect. And in a town whose products have been tagged as losers as compared to the Japanese, these awards are a chance to put itself on a pedestal and come out a winner. Ed Garston, CNN, Detroit. And once again, we'll remind you that we are expecting a briefing from White House spokesman Marlon Fitzwater, who, of course, is traveling in Tokyo with President Bush. Fitzwater expected to brief on the president's night and rest there and his condition. We'll bring that to you live when it occurs. The World Today continues. We drove an engine 200,000 grueling miles using new Mobile One. Then we ripped it apart. What did we find? Nothing. Nothing. Virtually no engine wear. What kept these vital engine parts like new? This part. New advanced formula Mobile One. It keeps your engine running like new. In Arizona's Sonoran Desert lies the Scottsdale Princess. A spot the touring pros hit every year. The Scottsdale Princess. A spot so sweet. The AAA awarded it a perfect five diamonds. It's the Scottsdale Sweet Spot. Stay three or more nights and your rental car is free. Call your travel agent now. This is regular. This is better. This bufferin is regular. For headaches, anison is better. Why better? Regular bufferin has one ingredient. Anison has two, a pain medicine plus a second ingredient that makes it work better. Get anison. Get better. What happens when you buy Purina Biscuits brand dog snacks? You get a coupon worth $1.50 off any Purina dog food. Here's how it works. Buy Purina Biscuits, get $1.50 off. Purina Biscuits, $1.50 off. Purina Biscuits, $1.50 off. Purina Biscuits, $1.50 off. Purina Biscuits, $1.50 off. Purina Remember, with Purina Biscuits, you'll never have to pay full price for Purina dog food again. Nice dog! Tonight, thrust into the spotlight of Iran Contra, now conservative guest host Oliver North plays the right field to Mike Kinsley's left in the crossfire. Tonight, 7.30 Eastern on CNN. Health officials in Florida say unsterilized equipment in a doctor's office caused a recent hepatitis outbreak. Three people died and some 200 others were infected. Fort Myers dermatologist Dr. Robert Boudreau was cited for not exercising proper precautions. The doctor did not carry the hepatitis virus himself. 
nearly all infected had undergone, undergone some form of invasive surgery. Dr. Boudreau voluntarily closed his pa practice in November. Parents who feed formula to their babies should be aware of a potential lead poisoning problem. According to a study in today's New England Journal of Medicine, the source of the lead may be as near as your kitchen sink. CNN's Carolyn O'Neill has our report. Cassie Parkos is almost two and appears to be just fine. M. 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 Good. But when she was nine months old, a blood test revealed that she was poisoned with lead. 10 micrograms per deciliter is the recommended safe level. Cassie's blood contained three times that. It was shocking. It was devastating. It was just uh, unbelievable. Nikki Parkos had the house paint and dust tested. No lead problem there. Then they tested the water. The federal standard for lead says drinking water should contain no more than 15 parts per billion. And ours was 400. And that lead-filled tap water was used to mix every bottle of Cassie's infant formula. Dr. Michael Shannon, toxicologist for the lead clinic at Boston's Children's Hospital, investigated 10 similar cases. Life, these 10 cases we had, I think, in that sense, were absolutely tragic in that this is what the children were given with every meal, every day for the first 6 to 12 months of their life, um, was lead contaminated formula. It's such a tragedy. A letter from Dr. Shannon in the New England Journal of Medicine reports three practices that may increase the lead levels in reconstituted infant formulas. First, parents careful to follow label directions to boil water before mixing formula may be exposing their babies to too much lead if they boil the water longer than the recommended five minutes. Another thing the families had in common is that they mixed their baby formula in the morning. And researchers found that morning tap water has the highest lead levels of the day. So doctors say let this first draw water run for at least two minutes. Also note that hot tap water contains more lead than cold. And if you're going to boil water, make sure the kettle is lead free. Two of the children's hospital cases involved imported or antique kettles. Thank you. You're welcome. The Parkos have moved to a new house now where the water is lead free, but they're not worry free yet. We don't really know until she's about five and starting school and they can see if there's any learning problems at that point. Carolyn O'Neill, CNN. And still ahead on the world today, we're expecting a briefing from White House spokesman Marlon Fitzwater from Tokyo on the president's condition. We'll bring it to you live. of nation on flu alert earliest outbreak in 10 years severe flu season underway what will you do get serious medicine doctors recommend theraflu theraflu is hot liquid medicine strong therapy for flu symptoms hot liquid therapy that works fast what will you do when you get the flu doctors recommend theraflu strong therapy for flu symptoms Many people know my point of view. It's the mentality of the person, not the gun in their hand, that's killing. But there are other points of view. You're going to go to Chief Greenberg, South Carolina Police. My role will not just be that of a moderator, but a participant. You really never know, but you will see or hear. So all the laws in the books, well, who's going to back them up? Because it's unrehearsed. Where do we stop the killing? People come out of prison, repeat their crimes at an 80% level. It's called real TV. This picture of the White House briefing room in Tokyo, Japan, where shortly White House spokesman Marlon Fitzwater is expected to brief on the condition of President Bush after his rough evening last night at the state dinner and what is being diagnosed by White House officials as a case of stomach flu. When that briefing takes place, we will bring it to you live. 
ousted Georgian leaders Viad Gamsakurdi ran uh, uh, though ran out of town but run out of town sorry by opposition forces is standing defiant saying he still considers himself president of the former Soviet Republic and his supporters ignoring a ban on demonstrations poured into the streets of Tbilisi today calling for him to be reinstated but interim government leaders who charged he turned into a dictator after being elected last May say Gamsakurdi's name will not be on the ballot in elections tentatively scheduled for the spring. Disgruntled shoppers heckled Boris Yeltsin today as the Russian president visited several towns hit hard by soaring prices. Last week's end of price controls pushed the co cost of many goods out of consumers' reach. So far, the price hikes have failed to increase food supplies, as promised. Many Russians are asking for outside assistance, saying they need it to survive the winter. CNN's Christian Amanpour reports on one city in need, an historic city that knows what suffering is all about. This city knows all about hunger. An eternal flame burns beside the mass graves of those who died of starvation during the Nazis' 900-day siege of Leningrad in World War II. The young come to pay their respects. Those old enough to remember are afraid. I think it will be really bad. Can you imagine potatoes being three times more expensive? Even if we eat only bread and potatoes, we can hardly make ends meet. Outside the metro stations and at the markets, St. Petersburg's new paupers are selling off their own belongings, clothes, trinkets, and even a toilet seat, trying to raise a few extra rubles. City officials admit they won't make it through the winter or even the next 30 days without help. We have only half the food supplies we need for the coming months. We're expecting aid from abroad, and we're very thankful for whatever we get. Handouts, large and small, are being delivered to the hardest hit, to an old woman who must support herself and her invalid son. She's pathetically grateful for this gift from Germany. She says it'll last her all winter. In the stores, the prices are high and there's not much to buy. Outside, the lines last well after dark. I spend my whole day working hard, and I come here and there is nothing. I've been to three stores already. It's intolerable. City officials want to turn St. Petersburg into a mecca for culture and tourism. They are giving her beautiful old face a lift, setting up joint ventures, about 500 so far, trying to sell off state stores, restaurants and factories to private investors, and trying to change the work ethic. But even under the best of circumstances, Officials say it'll take at least 10 to 15 years before stability and real economic growth take hold. Christiana Manpour, CNN, St. Petersburg. And again, we remind you that we are expecting shortly a briefing from White House spokesman Marlon Fitzwater in Tokyo. When it occurs, we'll bring it to you live. The World Today continues, followed by Moneyline. After this local commercial break, next on CNN. Great legs. Thank you. How do you get them? I used to do aerobics till I dropped. Then I found Thighmaster. Every single time you squeeze Thighmaster, you strengthen and tone right where you need it. So it's easy to squeeze, squeeze your way to shapely hips and thighs. I thought I'd never fit into these jeans again. Thank you, Thigh Master. I recommend it and use it. The secret to shapely thighs is exercising these muscles with just the right resistance. This balanced resistance coil is designed to give you results quickly and comfortably. Want to tone your upper chest and arms? Thigh Master will give you excellent results. Thigh Master, we may not have been born with great legs, but now we can look like we were. To order your Thigh Master, call 1 800 257 1257. Have your credit card ready or send check or money order for $19.95 plus $4.50 for shipping and handling to this address. No CODs, please. If you're not fully satisfied, return it in 30 days for your money back. Plus, if you call right now, we'll also send you Suzanne Slender for Life Plan absolutely free. Call now for quick delivery. This is CNN. Few people have their health as closely scrutinized as the President of the United States. A mere rumor can send shudders through the financial markets. So it was hardly surprising that these pictures caused considerable concern earlier today. Happily, the White House says President Bush was only suffering from the stomach flu and is recovering. 
But unfairly or not, the incident has overshadowed, for now at least, the stated purpose of Mr. Bush's trip to Japan, trade. And it's also focused attention once again on Vice President Dan Quayle. Joining me now, CNN political analyst and Baltimore Evening Sun columnist Jack Germond and syndicated, syndicated columnist Ben Wattenberg, who traveled to Japan recently. Gentlemen, thanks a lot uh, for joining us. To what extent, I mean, we've seen presidential illnesses and stumbles before they grab an inordinate amount of headline and attention the day of. Uh, do they overshadow the, the trip on which the president has embarked in a, in a real sense? Well, it'd be a good, I think from his standpoint, it'd be a good thing if it overshadowed the trip. <laughs> <laughs> the, the trip was not going to go very well politically. Uh, well, we were hearing a lot about these trade or, tensions. Uh, it didn't seem to be. And I'll tell you what happens now is that it's more difficult for the Democrats to criticize the trip and the results of the trip when the president's been sick and he's just recovering and he's pale and wan and so forth. Sympathy. Yeah, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but when they're, when they're out on the, on the campaign trail, I mean, I, I think this, there's a misconception on, on, on this trip. I mean, the image you have is of 21 blue suits with tin cups out there, and they all say, you know, we're American, big CEOs, and, please, please, and, and the prime minister of Japan says we have to give these poor people compassion. Well, that is not what the American voters want to hear, in my judgment, and I think the Democrats will make hay with it. I'm curious as to how this may play in Japan itself. We were hearing an awful lot about the harsh criticism of the president and these CEOs coming with him in the Japanese press. And earlier, Charles Bierbauer held up the headlines, and this was the president's collapse was big headlines in the, in the Japanese press. How might it play there? How might it fall out there? I mean, I'm asking you to speculate, I realize, in an area that's not exactly your yeah. beats. <laughs> But uh, Ben, you were in Japan just a few weeks ago. Well, I I, I don't know. I mean, it, it would play like a big like a big news story. I mean, visiting uh, president of the SSS, the sole surviving superpower, collapses at, at your state dinner. So it's big news. I mean, some of the Japanese intellectuals and, and uh, commentators are making the case that America is in decline. Now, I don't happen to think that's true. I don't think President Bush thinks that's true. A lot of Japanese don't think it's true, but a lot do. And I think this would you know they will have some fun with that story. You know, president comes to Japan and collapses. See, it's just like America. Right, now, strip away, it, yeah. strip away the presidential health story for a minute, and let's look at the trade mission, the mission on this trip. Jack, you were saying you don't think this has been going very well. Well, I mean, the the fact is the ba the kind of basic things that uh, the president would have to accomplish to make this a jobs trip as opposed to a a trade trip, long range trip, and so forth, which it was originally. The kind of concessions he would have to get, he is not going to get, and that's already clear. The uh, actually would be a good thing in a, in a sense if the Japanese bash him a little bit because. There's very little sympathy for the Japanese and the American electorate right now. Is he coming in back with anything that you can tell? Well, I, I guess he'll come back with what the trade experts would, would, would call uh, m minor concessions. But, but a minor concession is <laughs> enough, is the question. Minor concessions, I don't think, are, are, uh, are enough politically. And there's something else. I mean, this whole mission, the way it's playing out, at least the optics of it, is that it's managed trade, not open trade. And this is an administration that's beating up on Democrats, I, I think, you know, with, with, with some merit, be, because they are saying managed trade, and, 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 and the, the Republicans, the free traders, uh, the great internationalists are saying open trade. And then you sit down in the smoke-filled room and you start cutting the cards and say, you gotta buy, you gotta buy these auto parts and you gotta do that. I mean, what they're doing, after all, is trying to get the Japanese government to push Japanese corporations, to push Japanese consumers, to buy American cars. Well, that's not open trade. You know, it's an interesting coincidence, too, uh, maybe an unfortunate one, I suppose it depends on your point of view, that Dan Quayle was scheduled to go up to New Hampshire today to do some badly needed politicking up there, it would mm -hmm. seem, mm -hmm. just as the Washington Post is running this extensive and fairly favorable profile of him, just as we have another presidential health glitch. What's happening on the Dan Quayle front, Jack? Well, I mean, they're using Dan Quayle up there as a surrogate. They, I find that a little puzzling because there was just a survey a poll down of New Hampshire Republicans that say Dan Quayle is in terrible odor with those Republicans, yet they're using him as a surrogate because they want to firm up their base on the right uh, against Pat Buchanan. The, uh, I think this would have, nobody would have paid much attention to this one way or the other if it hadn't been for this health incident, this episode. To this, what, what's the this? This is the Quayle thing. Mm -hmm. I mean, people don't, People are not impressed by surrogates. Voters are too intelligent to be impressed but by surrogates. But, Jack, he, he's not just a surrogate. I mean, he is vice president of the United States. He is the mythical one heartbeat away from the presidency. What I think is interesting in that Woodward and uh, Broder piece in the, uh, in the Washington Post kind of points it up. All right, gentlemen, I'm sorry I'm going to cut you off because Marlon, is looking better. Marlon Fitzwater is coming out for the briefing in Tokyo now. Let's go to Tokyo. Night, he woke at eight, about 6.30 this morning. He's up and about at the Akasaka Palace. He still is suffering from some weakness related to the flu, but the major symptoms have subsided. 
All of the President's vital signs this morning are normal, as they were last night. There is no indication of any illness other than the common flu. No medication has been prescribed for today. I spoke with the President this morning. He is in good spirits. He's concerned about the inconvenience caused to dinner guests last night. He joked he might have a large dry cleaning bill to deal with. This morning, the President made a number of telephone calls including Vice President Quayle, Chief of Staff Skinner, and members of his family. Dr. Burton Lee, the President's physician, reports that the President is in overall excellent health and should recover from this bout with the flu in a normal period of time. In fact, the President expects to resume much of his schedule here in Tokyo this afternoon. The revised schedule will be released by the press office soon. Secretary of Treasury Nicholas Brady will deliver the President's address to the Japanese Welcoming Committee. The President will have the one-on-one -on -one meeting with Prime Minister Miyazawa, and the joint press conference will be held at 3.30 this afternoon as, as scheduled. The President feels the trip is going very well and hopes that this episode will not detract from the overall focus of the visit. He thanks Prime Minister Miyazawa for his many courtesies last night and looks forward to the business meeting with him this afternoon. I'll try and answer your questions. What about the Kodak plan? Yes, uh, Secretary of Commerce Mossbacker will go to the Kodak plant uh, for President Bush. He will visit, that's the uh, Kodak Japan R&D Center in Yokohama, and he will depart at 1.15 p.m. and will have press coverage as originally planned. How about the state dinner? State dinner tonight is still on. The president plans to attend. Uh, the, uh, no, there are no changes at this point. Have any precautionary tests been made, uh, such as an electrocardiogram? Uh, the doctors are certain that there is no uh, other illness or any other problems related to this, that it's a simple case of the flu. The president is human. He gets sick. And I would refer you to last night's pool report that said half the press corps has been sick with the flu since we left. Marlon, Marlon did the yes. president at any point, in fact, lose consciousness? Uh, I don't know. He fainted, uh, fell down behind the table, and was up in just a few seconds. As you know, uh, Dr. Lee was right there, noticed that he was uh, looking uh, pale earlier, so was right beside him. Uh, Dr. Lee said that he was uh, just there on the floor. He, Dr. Lee asked him to stay. Uh, motionless for a few minutes until he could uh, uh, be sure of his condition. So uh, I think uh, a fainted condition is the best uh, description. Yes, Gastroenteritis has a couple different forms. One is viral, one is, is from an irritation. Uh, uh, can you tell us which this is? Yeah, I don't know. No, I don't know. Hey, just Marlon, do we know? Uh, we don't believe he is, no. Yes? Do we know who made the decision, whether the president's own decision, if he was the part of the, the limousine rather than the other one? Uh, it was the, the uh, doctor and the uh, security. Yes, Ellen? Marlon, can you tell us the test that the president has undergone? Did he have an electrocardiogram? Mm -hmm. was, his, was his heart rate checked? No, we, yeah. I won't go into any of the tests, but suffice to say that uh, there's no indication of any illness other than the uh, flu. He's under no medication of any kind today. He's recovering absolutely normal way, and it's a very common flu. Well, last night you said that the president had not lost consciousness. Now you seem to be suggesting that he may have for a few seconds. Can you clarify that, please? Uh, he, he fainted. Uh, all his vital signs were normal. That's all I'm willing to say about the test. And that was the same last night and this morning. Do you have, do you have any more information today about the president's uh, uh, taking Halcyon? No, I don't uh, have any indication. What other drugs does he? Uh, no, he's normal. Tim. Uh, when's the first time we're going to see the president today? You will see him at the uh, bilateral meeting with Prime Minister Miyazawa, which is about 1.30. And we'll have a photo op at the top of that also. And, and then you have a press conference with him at 3.30. So he can just... <laughs> I'm sorry, go ahead. Did he talk to anyone else besides Skinner, his family, and Quayle? No, just the ones I mentioned. He was making other phone calls, so by now he may have talked to more, but as of 8 o'clock, those are who he talked to. Yes. Rita? Marla, he's, so he's not, he's canceling this morning. He's not participating in this uh, morning bilat that he was going to do, the extended bilateral. The, the, that's moved till this afternoon, to 1.30. All the meetings that were on the schedule are being retained on the schedule, but they're being, that we put on this afternoon instead of this morning. Uh, Secretary Mossbacker, as you know, made the speech for him at breakfast this morning. 
Secretary Brady will make the speech uh, this early at lunch in the day. What's President Bush going to be doing? Just resting until uh, second? Yes, he's just resting. Well, what symptoms does he now have? If he hasn't got a fever no. and he's normal, then what are the symptoms that tell you he still has the flu? He's uh, he's a little weak from uh, the loss of fluids last night and uh, and and is resting for that. And he has and he has a little bit of nausea. He's sipping fluids at this point. Had any solid food since He's last not, night? Not had solid foods. Solid food again? Do you know? Don't know. Has he been sick to his stomach since uh, last night? No, he is not. Do you know what medication he has taken on this trip other than Halcyon? Tegan is the only thing for nausea taken last night. No heart medication, nothing else. No. Thyroid medicine, thyroid medicine model? Uh, all of that medication has been completed. Thyroid well, the thyroid is a continuum yeah. thing, yes. But there's no, there's no connection. Yes, Gene. Is he going to go ahead with the state dinner tonight at the palace? Or what? Plans are to go ahead with the state dinner. Have you conducted any business this morning? Just the phone calls that I mentioned. Well, One more question, Leo. Early uh, afternoon meeting with Miyazawa. Is that going to be continuing negotiations on the trade stuff, or has this been pretty well buttoned up? No, it'll be across the board discussions. Uh, as you know, the uh, meetings were going on last night and still this morning with the foreign ministry and uh, U.S. Uh, traveling officials on all the various sectoral questions. Those meetings are continuing again this morning. Uh, we feel progress has been made, uh, but there's, they are not uh, buttoned up at this point. Well, so, is the president going to have to involve himself today in these negotiations to button up the action plan, or is he basically leaving that now to Mossbacker and Brady? I don't expect uh, any of them to be involved in negotiations. Those are being handled by uh, our State Department officials who have been working at the Foreign Ministry. The president's conversations w with the Prime Minister uh, relate to uh, security matters as well as some general economic matters. But the negotiations on sectoral changes are being conducted at the, uh, uh, at the ministerial level. Marlon, yes, George. Uh, Marlon, last night you suggested that you didn't, there wasn't any need to change the president's habit of a rigorous schedule on these trips. Isn't there an element of common sense that, for example, a 67-year-old man who has the flu doesn't play tennis, <clears throat> doesn't take sleeping pills and so on? Why not change well, common sense would say there's a lot of 67-year-old people who play tennis and, and do those things, and it's quite normal for the president. There's no reason to not do it. He's the only one who's president of the United States. And that's his normal routine. He's a vigorous man, very healthy. There's no reason for him to change his schedule at all. Well, whose decision was it to cancel this morning events? Did, did he make that decision, or was he, was he told by the doctor that he shouldn't? No, that's a collective decision by the staff. Marley, yes. you described those talks last night as severe and a lot of pressure being put on. Has the character of them changed in any way? Have any agreements been reached? Or do they continue yeah. to be hard-fought battles? The sectoral dis uh, discussions are all hard-fought battles. I would say they're very tough negotiations going on. Um, on both sides have very strong uh, positions and a lot at stake, and uh, we're working those very hard position to say whether there will be any any specific substantive achievements or uh, will you leave here uh, with uh, nothing resolved? Well, we feel very uh, encouraged by the whole process. We think we've uh, already had a very successful trip and it will be even more successful by the time we're ready to leave. Uh, that really doesn't answer the question whether there will be specific accomplishments. There have already been specific accomplishments and there will be more. <clears throat> Rita. On the trade talks, um, can you say that there have been, uh, aside from the tough talks, still continuing several areas of agreement yet, or, or <coughs> just um, all contentious? There are several areas of agreement. There are several areas that are still being discussed. Marlon, the president has said uh, quite a few times that the only thing that might make him change his mind about running for re-election yeah. is health. It doesn't include the flu. Can you, well, that's the question. Uh, can you uh, tell us that this episode will have absolutely no effect on his uh, re-election plans? It will have absolutely no effect on his re-election plans. Thank you very much.
White House spokesman Marlon Fitzwater filling in a few more details on the president's condition, of course, having some comments as well on the trade issues on the table in Tokyo as well. Fitzwater saying President Bush's vital signs are normal after a more or less normal night of rest. There's no indication of any illness other than the common flu. Mr. Bush is under, uh, under no medications at the present time, and according to Fitzwater, he's in good spirits, even going so far as to joke that he'll have a somewhat hefty dry cleaning bill after last night's event at the state dinner, offering apologies for for the guests there. Uh, Fitzwater also added, however, one other little bit of detail that we hadn't heard before, at least not quite so explicitly, I don't believe, and that was, according to Fitzwater, that the president fainted briefly uh, when he became ill last night at the state dinner in Japan. Fitzwater saying uh, that, uh, uh, the, again, that uh, the president's vital signs are normal. He would not go into which specific tests had been applied. It's worth pointing out to you just now some of those many questions you heard from the White House press corps sort of fit the bill of the kind of level of curiosity that surrounds the president's health when anything like that occurs. We've seen it any number of times before with a presidential illness, no matter how slight. It's a matter of record and it's a matter of history, and it is the sort of thing that presidential spokesmen are called upon to explain when the president's health comes into question. Once again, we repeat that the president uh, appears, according to Fitzwater, to be resting comfortably now, his vital signs normal. He's expected to have his first public appearance about four and three quarters hours from now. Now, our correspondent, Charles Bierbauer, is standing by live in Tokyo. He was at that briefing. Uh, Charles, I guess we'll be seeing the president um, this afternoon, your time, after a rather uh, explosive day. Well, the president's going to take the morning and continue to rest. We're told that he did sleep well. He's not on any specific medication for the flu uh, this morning. Uh, he's been taking some liquids. He's been making some phone calls, all fairly positive signs. He has curtailed his schedule. He's going to let the Secretary of the Treasury sit in on stand in for him on a speech uh, at a luncheon. Secretary of Commerce Mossbacher will pay a visit to a Kodak laboratory here. But the president will carry on with the hard business. Those are more uh, uh, photo op events, uh, more on the surface. The hard meetings, the detailed discussions with Prime Minister Miyazawa will continue this afternoon, pushed back a few hours from this morning. Uh, on the periphery, but uh, certainly uh, no less important, the negotiations between U.S. and Japanese officials over the trade questions, uh, import restrictions, trying to uh, knock down some barriers uh, as far as the U.S. is concerned, continue, according to White House spokesman Marlon Fitzwater. Those go on. They're tough, uh, detailed negotiations. Fitzwater says there have been some accomplishments. Perhaps we'll hear a little more detail of that when the president and Prime Minister Miyazawa do hold a joint news conference. That will go on as close to schedule as possible uh, here this afternoon. Frank? Uh, Charles, uh, I noticed in one of your earlier reports you held up some Japanese newspapers giving some indication of how this thing is being followed, the health uh, flap was being sure. uh, perceived there. Uh, what has been the, the uh, response uh, from the, the host? The Japanese are always quite anxious to be quite gracious hosts in a, in a visit such as this. Oh, indeed, uh, the, the Prime Minister uh, conveyed uh, uh, his concern to the President, sent a message over to the Akasaka Palace uh, after the dinner. Uh, uh, you uh, probably noted in those pictures from last night uh, that Mr. Miyazawa was uh, right at the President's side after he collapsed during the dinner. Uh, he, uh, as uh, Marlon Fitzwater uh, noted this morning, the uh, President and Prime Minister seemed to have established uh, a, a new kind of relationship, an unfortunate one perhaps, but uh, certainly Mr. Miyazawa and Mr. Bush uh, have had a, a very friendly relationship throughout this, me uh, this meeting here and uh, we'll be getting back together. I think the, the, the emphasis is that the president has the flu. As uh, Mr. Fitzwater put it, he's human, just like everyone else, people get the flu. And the uh, last line coming out of this news conference was that it will have no effect whatsoever on the president's uh, plans to seek re-election. Frank? Thanks, Charles. No effect either on the trade talks, which remain quite difficult, as we heard earlier. One other note, uh, CNN will attempt to bring you coverage of the meeting between Prime Minister Miyazawa and President Bush. That is expected to happen at 1.30 p.m. time in Tokyo. That's 1.30 uh, p.m. in Tokyo. That's 11.30 p.m. our time here in the East. We, again, will attempt to bring that to you live as it happens. The World Today will continue after this. The man who lives in this house made good money in stocks. The man who lives in this house made even more money selling him the stocks. If you'd like your money to make more money for you instead of someone else, call Oldie Discount.
We'll provide you with personal service and investments to help you achieve financial success. So move up to Oldie, America's full-service discount broker. What happens when you buy Purina Biscuits brand dog snacks? You get a coupon worth $1.50 off any Purina dog food. Here's how it works. Buy Purina Biscuits, get $1.50 off. Purina Biscuits, $1.50 off. Purina Biscuits, $1.50 off. Purina Biscuits, $1.50 off. Purina Biscuits, $1.50 off. Purina Biscuits. Remember, with Purina Biscuits, you'll never have to pay full price for Purina dog food again. Nice! On CNN tonight, the president felt sick, but there was no passing of power. Is Dan Quayle qualified in the crossfire? Then former President Richard Nixon visits Larry King live, all tonight on CNN. Now on to other news here on The World Today. For years, astronomers have been searching space to see if life exists beyond planet Earth. Now, some say they found convincing evidence of, if not life, at least other planets orbiting a distant star. CNN science correspondent Mark Levinson gazes skyward in tonight's science report. These are real postcards from the edge, the edge of our galaxy, some 1,500 light years from Earth. They're radio signals from a pulsar, a rapidly spinning star that beams radio waves into space. For more than a year, astronomer Alex Volshan listened to the pulsar signals with the help of a giant ear, the huge radio receiver at the Arecibo Observatory in Puerto Rico. Computer analysis of the signals shows the pulsar is orbited by two or maybe three planets. We have looked at, considered, and eliminated the whole array of most obvious alternative explanations, and it appears that the best way to explain what we have found is planets around the pulsar. The discovery raises new questions about how and where planets develop. Scientists think our solar system formed after another star blew up billions of years ago, leaving rock and debris to condense into a new star and new planets. Current theory holds that planets only form around healthy stars. But the new evidence suggests planets can also form from debris around very rare stars like pulsars that are in their final stages of life. Bolchon says the pulsar he studied sends a radio beam to Earth 162 times a second. But over time, some signals arrived sooner or later than expected. The inconsistency gives evidence for two or three planets whose gravitational tug causes the pulsar to wobble. Bolchon says the new planets orbiting the pulsar are more massive than Earth, but are about as close to their sun as Mercury is to ours. It's, of course, a very exciting thing to find, a very possibly find, uh, the planetary system because we have been looking for planetary systems other than our own for a long, long time. There have been many claims of new planetary finds. Just last July, British astronomers using a radio telescope found evidence of a huge mysterious planet revolving around another distant pulsar. It seems to imply that there might be planets everywhere, that if you can make a planet in this unusual circumstance around the ember of a dead star, that you might be able to make them around any star. And there's a trillion stars at least in our galaxy and millions of galaxies and so on. Volchon says both his and the English discoveries could trigger a new wave in radio astronomy as scientists scan the unlikely parts of the heavens for more signs that our solar system is not alone. Mark Levinson, CNN, reporting. Science and Technology Today is brought to you by the people at AT&T. AT&T, the right choice. So you get to go to Asia on business for two weeks. I'll try to call you every day. Try? It's not always easy overseas. Well, I'm going to make it easy for you. 
USA Direct. AT&T USA Direct service, another way AT&T can help you from practically anywhere. Every country you're going to has a special number. You just dial it and get right back here to an AT&T operator. And more importantly, me. For a free USA Direct information card, call 1-800-874-4000. Headline News, I'm Chuck Roberts. Baltic leaders are already working. From the NCAA basketball. When you need the latest news, business and sports, updated every 30 minutes around the clock, you need CNN Headline News. Anytime, all the time. Look at these red marks. These old glasses do nothing but pinch. They're a pain. You don't have to put up with glasses that don't fit anymore. Now Lens Crafters brings you better fit for greater comfort. Lens Crafters glasses fit your snug points with features like new self-adjusting snug fit pads that flex to gently and securely hug your nose. No more pinching. I never knew glasses could be this comfortable. Lens Crafters. Better fit for greater comfort. In about an hour. There was a time when aerodynamic design and agile handling would have been unheard of in a car this roomy. A time when a V8 that's more powerful and more efficient would have been simply inconceivable. But that was then, and this is now. The new Ford Crown Victoria. Have you ever wished the traditional could become the exceptional? Have you driven a Ford lately? He's a little weak, but resting and recovering. From White House spokesman Marlon Fitzwater, an update on President Bush's condition in the wake of a bout with stomach flu. Fitzwater held a briefing and fielded reporters' questions a short time ago in Tokyo. President Bush got a decent night's sleep last night. He woke at eight, about 6.30 this morning. He's up and about at the Akasaka Palace. He still is suffering from some weakness related to the flu, but the major symptoms have subsided. All of the president's vital signs this morning are normal, as they were last night. There is no indication of any illness other than the common flu. No medication has been prescribed for today. I spoke with the president this morning. He is in good spirits. He's concerned about the inconvenience caused to dinner guests last night. He joked he might have a large dry cleaning bill to deal with. This morning, the president made a number of telephone calls including Vice President Quayle, Chief of Staff Skinner, and members of his family. Dr. Burton Lee, the President's physician, reports that the President is in overall excellent health and should recover from this bout with the flu in a normal period of time. In fact, the President expects to resume much of his schedule here in Tokyo this afternoon. The first event on the president's schedule about four and a half hours from now when he'll hold a meeting with Japanese Prime Minister Miyazawa. We will continue to keep you updated on Mr. Bush's health and the progress of his trade mission in Japan as developments warrant. And that's our look at the world today. I'm Frank Sesno in Washington. Thanks for joining us. Moneyline is up next, and Bill Hartley joins us with a look ahead. Bill? Thanks, Frank. Coming right up on Moneyline with Lou Dobbs, President Bush, as you know, falls ill in Tokyo. But his quest for trade concessions goes on. We'll have a live report from Tokyo on both the president's condition and the trade negotiations. Plus, oil prices plunge again. Supply is high. More is coming. A report on where oil prices are going. All that's next on Moneyline.